of my head off when I realized it. And it took me about four months of thinking to figure this out. Because when, when I was in graduate school at McGill, I was really interested, I became really interested in the reality of evil. And I was very interested in the viability of nihilistic beliefs. You know, what, why bother if everything's going to disappear in 100 years? Who cares? Life, you know, it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. In the final analysis, life is meaningless. Right. Okay, well, you know, you can make a credible case for that. Now, it's an upsetting case. Because once you accept that, first of all, you're anxious and hurt by it. So that's not so good. And second, it kind of makes you aimless. And that's part of nihilism. It's like, you know, you're anxious and upset, but you're also aimless. Because why bother? And fair enough, but you can make a credible case for it. But then I thought, well... When that gets out of hand, maybe you're nihilistic because life, because you're mortal and life ends in death. So you're sort of nihilistic because of suffering. And so then you become nihilistic as a logical response to that. And then what happens? And then what you see is that nihilistic people definitely make suffering worse. Definitely. They make it worse for themselves, for sure. But then they get better because their lives are so unbearable and then they start to take it out on other people. So if you are nihilistic, that's not neutral. It gets bad real fast. So then I thought, well, what are, are there any antidotes to meaninglessness? And rational antidotes are hard to come by because you can just say, well, who cares if in a thousand years we're all going to be dead? What, why get out of bed in the morning? You can't really make, mount a rational case why that's not reasonable. Now, I'm not saying it is reasonable, but I thought about music. Music is a very strange art form. I had a great journalist friend of mine. He said to me the other day, he said, all art aspires to the condition of music, which I thought was great. But music, it's, you think about the revitalizing effect mu music continues to have in our culture, especially among young people. And that's really, really been the case since the beginning of the 60s. It's like... We got more nihilistic and less religious and all of that as our culture became more secular and more rational, more materialistic. And at the same time, the power of music as a cultural phenomenon just grew and grew and grew and grew. Say, so music gives you the intimation of meaning, right, directly. So I used to watch punk rockers. I went to a Ramones concert once, which was really fun. We were up in the second floor of this theater in Montreal, and uh, the Ramones were playing on stage like a hundred feet away with their with their like their uh, their their huge stu not their studio uh, stadium equipment. It was so loud in there, like I had to listen to the whole concert with my ears plugged, and I was still like three quarters deaf for three days. And beneath us, on the uh, the stage sort of in front of the stage there was a flat place and all these punks were down there smashing into each other and 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 doing this this really rough dance and i thought this is so cool we got all these nihilistic punks in here like half beating themselves up dancing and in and and being taken in by this rough music that gave them even in their aggressive nihilism a sense of meaning i thought that was so cool so why does music do that that's a good question, because people think of music as a non-representational art. It doesn't represent anything. It's not like a drawing or a picture, or even dance where you can act something out. It's really? Non-representational. I don't agree with that. Like, what do you mean by music being non-representational? -rep well, it's not a picture of anything. Right, but it represents the feeling of the person who puts out the, the lyrics. Yeah, the feeling got, of the person true, who composes got the music. True, it's got emotional content. That's, that's fair enough, okay. because there's... There's unhappy music and there's happy music, yeah. minor keys and major. And Definitely, the, it plays on emotions, for sure. But, but it still it doesn't represent anything like a picture represents it, okay. let's say, or a sculpture. That's saying. all I mean. Okay. Not that it's, I didn't say it was without content. I see what you're saying. But you said right. representation. Yeah, but it well, you could say it represents emotions, and fair yeah. enough, fair enough. Yeah. But I, I was thinking more like a picture of I an actual thing. Okay, okay. So, but what, so let's think about what music is. First of all, it's, it's a pattern. So non-patterned music is noise. It's a pattern. But then it isn't one pattern. It's multiple patterns layered on top of one another in a harmonious manner and in a manner that indicates, in some sense, communication between all the patterned layers because they have to go together. And so what's the world? Well, the world's made of objects. It's like, no, it's not. It's made of patterns. So music is just like the world. 
because the world's made of patterns. And then music has layered patterns that are all moving together in a harmonious manner. And so what do you do when you hear that, especially if it's got a beat? Well, then you move your body, and you want to, right? The music calls to you to move your body. So now you're moving your body in sync with the patterned layers of the world. Well, that's meaning. And then there's more to it, so that's so cool. Is music is an analog of the structure of existence itself. And it calls to you to take part in that. And then, so maybe you dance by yourself, or maybe even better, you dance with someone else. And so then you both bring your bodies into this patterned relationship with this multi-layer harmony together in a spontaneous way, indicating that you can both play and are therefore potentially trustworthy future mates. That's unbelievably cool. And birds dance. It's not just human beings, you know. So this is a deep thing. And then music does something else, too. It, it puts you on the border between chaos and order. Because a boring song does exactly what you expect it to do and, and gets dull very quickly. And an unlistenable song is so random you can't follow it. And so what you want is predictability with a leaven of unpredictability. And then that puts you right on the edge. That's the zone of proximal development. Vygotsky discovered that. Like a Hendrix song. Yeah, yeah like a Hendrix song. Well, any great music does yeah, that. But it, I mean, uh, Hendrix you, has so much creativity inside the structure of the song because mm -hmm. there's riffs that he'll right, do. Right, right, right. And everyone right. loves, oh man, I went to this yeah. bar in Nashville. Uh, this band was playing Kelly's Heroes, a great guitarist, the best guitarist I've ever seen. And they were playing old country music with a heavy blues rock uh, twist. So they do this great version of... Uh, Ghost Riders in the Sky, like 15 minutes long, and mm. this brilliant guitarist just goes way out on a limb. And everybody in the crowd, it's so, it was so fun to be there. They're just thrilled to death because they're watching this man doing the same thing that surfers do. He's like dancing on the edge of chaos and order in this virtuosic manner. And everyone is so taken by that that it just lifts them out of the normality of their existence. You know, you see this joy just transfuse them. And that's because they got an intimation of genuine meaning. And, it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's not amenable to rational criticism, which is the thing that I thought that struck me as so miraculous about music and why it has this element of salvation. It's like it puts you directly in touch with the meaning that sustains you in life, directly. And it shows you what that would be, which is something like to observe the harmonious interplay of the patterns of being stacked on top of one another, and then to bring yourself into alignment with that, which is what yogis strive to do and what disciplined athletes strive to do and what we celebrate in athletics. And it's all a reflection of the same thing. And that's real. It's real, that meaning. It's, it's real also in what it imparts on other people. It's not just, it's, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like, even though people can play beautiful music when no one's around, it's not the same as playing beautiful music in front of people because there's a thing that happens when people interact with that mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. Well, you see that, in, you know, if you get lucky, you go to a... Mu I went to a Leonard Cohen concert, one of the ones he put on when he went on tour when he was old. He lost all his money when he was in a Buddhist monastery. Dangers of being in a Buddhist monastery, by the way. Did he really? <laughs> yes, his manager, his manager, his uh, manager, Shanghai. Stole his money? Yeah, and so he had to go back on tour, which turned out to be a great thing because he made way more money on that tour than he did, I think, in his whole life. Did he get a new manager? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was an old friend of his as well. Oh, it was really boy. a catastrophe, but he he got better and better as he got old, kind of like Johnny Cash, you know, because Cash got damn near transcendent just before he died. He put out some songs like The Man Comes Around that are just, yeah. they're just unbelievable. He wrote a book on St. Paul, by the way. He did? So, yes, yes, he did. On St. Paul? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's pretty interesting. But so Cohen, when he came onto the stage, everybody gave him a standing ovation, and then he he played his sets, and it was like a religious experience, you know, and every, well, it was, it was a religious experience in the most fundamental sense, and everybody in the audience was there in the same place at the same time, doing the same thing with him, you know, mm -hmm. and you know what, what that's like when you go to a great, well, that can happen to, I'm sure it happens to you at your comedy shows. Yeah. When the whole audience is united and, and the stories are unrolling and everyone's focused on it, it's, it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but... It's similar. There's well, a hive mind. Well, it's also the good comedians are right. They're like musicians. They're right on the border between order and chaos. 
because the place of maximal funny is when you're just about pushing it too far, right? You think, oh, do I have to say this? <laughs> mm. You know, do I have to say this? Like, yeah, you have to say this. Okay, I'm going to say it. And everyone cracks up and they crack up, you know, and it blows apart their sterile preconceptions. That's part of cracking up, you mm. know, when you laugh. And it's so cool because it's the antidote to their totalitarianism, comedy. And that's why you can tell anybody who goes after a comedian, it's like, oh, yeah, I know who you are. You're the king who can't stand the fool. That's the tyrant. So you, you reveal yourself, same as people who go after musicians or dancers. 